which I won't have time to get to, of course. But, uh, yeah, so thanks a lot to the organizers for inviting me. Um, I picked a topic which I thought uh, peers might enjoy, uh, called uh, Interplay of Topology and Correlation Effects and Superconductivity. Uh, he's not here, though, <laughs> but uh, I'll, I'll still talk about this. Um, so this is work with my collaborators. Um, and so uh, Santel and uh, Liu Jun, uh, who's Santel student, uh, Yi Zhuang, who was a postdoc at Harvard, now at uh, San Diego. And, uh, but actually, most of the things I'll tell you was really done by, uh, sorry, my, my student, um, uh, Adrian Po, uh, who just graduated, and he's going to be a, a, a popular fellow at MIT. And so um, <clears throat> I'm over there. OK, so I'll be talking about uh, twisted bilayer graphene. I think you already heard a couple of talks um, yesterday. Um, so I'll try to make contact with those talks as well. You'll see there's a little bit of uh, this problem is actually more complicated, even at the band structure level, than um, uh, we initially anticipated. Uh, so it'll be important to kind of make, uh, make those uh, things uh, clear. OK, so uh, as you all know, there was this. Uh, amazing discovery in twisted bilayer graphene. Uh, but to put it in context, let me compare it to some other correlated systems that you're familiar with, uh, transition metal uh, systems, like the, the, the iron-based superconductors, the cuprate superconductors. All those cases, you have atoms with some correlated uh, orbital, d orbital maybe, uh, and uh, the spacing between the orbitals is, you know, the atomic spacing, uh, a tenth of a nanometer, uh, roughly. Um, and you get this kind of physics, uh, spin density waves, superconductivity, and so on. Cooperates, you get a clear insulator at uh, half filling. Uh, so here in this case, uh, which I'll describe in a little more detail, but I'm sure you all know roughly what it is, um, uh, the effective atoms, the effective lattice, is a factor of 100 bigger uh, than the lattice in the atomic systems. Okay? This Moiré super lattice uh, is of order 10 nanometers. That's the separation between these islands that you can kind of see with your eye. Um, and people were able to scan um, what happens to the system as a function of electronic density. Okay, and it's very easy to do that here. Rather than chemical doping, you just tune the voltage on a gate. Okay, and what they see is uh, at uh, half filling, which uh, you know, one of the main confusions here is really the electron count. I'll try to clarify that. At, at half filling, defined in a particular way, uh, you get a correlated insulator. Uh, interactions are essential to getting this insulator. Let's call it a Mott insulator, but uh, you, know, you have to be a bit careful with that word. You dope that, uh, small density of electrons or holes, uh, and you see a superconductor. Okay? And uh, the question is, um, you know, how, do we, how do we understand the system? How does it fit in with what we know about correlated electronic systems? Okay, so, there are, uh, so really, the, the reason you get this physics uh, in fact, it was uh, theoretically predicted that this is an interesting regime to look at, this magic angle uh, of around one degree, uh, because the uh, electronic bands are expect expected to be very flat. Okay, the kinetic energy is very small. Uh, interaction energy is relatively large. So you expect to get uh, correlation effects. Okay, so there are two kind of um, paradigms for strong correlation effects in electronic systems. Uh, one is the lowest lander, the, the lander level problem. Uh, you partially fill the lander level, you get all the exciting physics of the fractional quantum Hall effect. Uh, the other thing is correlated materials, uh, and it turns out that the recipe that you use to solve these two problems is actually very different. Okay, so for correlated electrons, what you do is you come up with a tight binding model that will describe the electronic band that's of interest, find out vanier functions, and then proceed to writing down a Hubbard model. And then the entire question becomes, you know, how do you solve the Hubbard model? Okay, but uh, basically, you, this part is kind of assumed uh, from the get-go. Uh, but uh, what I want to remind you is that uh, that's uh, completely different from the way in which you solve the lowest lander level problem. Okay, so in fact, you cannot implement the first step. You cannot write down a tight binding model with localized vanier orbitals to describe a single lander level. Okay, so there's an obstruction because of the churn number of the Landau band, uh, and we know that churn number is essential uh, to getting the fractional quantum Hall effect. Okay, so instead what you do is you work directly in the space of states, the lowest Landau level space of states. You're fortunate they have a simple 
relatively simple representation, and you project the interactions directly into this, uh, uh, into this band. Okay, so the question is, this problem that we are confronted with, uh, correlations in twisted bilayer graphene, uh, which paradigm does it fall into? Okay, is it something we have to directly work with, maybe at the level of momentum space, introducing interactions in momentum space, or can we write down something like a tight binding model? Okay, so I want to, what I want to convince you is that the answer is somewhere in between. The simplest version of a tight binding model uh, cannot work, uh, and I'll, I'll tell you exactly what I mean by uh, the simplest version. We want to retain all symmetries. Uh, we want to come up with the minimal model. Uh, that turns out is not possible, uh, but the situation is not as uh, difficult as the problem of the Landau level. Um, there are ways in which you can uh, sort of try to come up with something that looks like this, uh, but you'll have to give in uh, at some places. Okay, and it makes it a harder problem, I would say, um, than the, the physics of uh, typical uh, correlated electronic material. Okay, and that's where the topology that I was talking about uh, comes in. Okay, so this is um, uh, monolayer graphene. Um, this is two layers, uh, and this is what we want to think about when you twist them by some small angle. Uh, this is not a small angle. This is a very big angle. This is 21 degrees, uh, but it's somewhat harder to draw pictures of the small angle uh, uh, structures. Okay, but what will be very important is that the physics at small angles is actually quite different. Okay, and we'll have to, uh, you know, be a bit careful about that. We'll see that there are certain emergent symmetries, uh, and that's going to be very important for our, our story. Okay, so when you look at the structure, you see that uh, the blue and the red are the two layers. Um, there are places where uh, the lattice points more or less align. This would be this alignment uh, would be much better in the small angle case. Um, and there are places which look more like bilayer graphene, right? So in the usual Bernal stacked bilayer graphene, you have one side in the center of the hexagon and then only the A sides, for example, are um, uh, kind of eclipsed from the, top, from the top and the bottom layers. Okay, so there are regions, we'll call this AA regions, where they're, they're all on top of each other. We'll call this AB regions because one sublattice is over another sublattice, but uh, they're different sublattices. Okay, so, um, so that terminology will kind of appear. Uh... Okay, so what was discovered um, several years back by these uh, you know, uh, electronic structure calculations was that if you carefully tune this twist angle, uh, you can get to certain angles where uh, the dispersion of the bands is very small. Okay, and uh, those were called magic angles, and the most relevant one, this is actually the largest uh, magic angle, is about one degree. Yeah, and in that case, uh, if you make a simple comparison, uh, you'll see that electronic interactions can be, electron-electron interactions can be very important. Um, so strictly in these models, the, the band width is literally zero um, at the magic angles. If you do a slightly more realistic calculation, example by these people, they looked into the effects of relaxation of the lattice. It has some bandwidth. So they obtained something like eight milli electron volts. Um, there are others who might obtain about twice that number. Uh, but this energy scale uh, is significantly smaller than a crude estimate of the Coulomb in interaction. Okay, so so cool, uh, estimate of the Coulomb interactions, you imagine a pair of electrons separated by a lattice site, take the dielectric constant of your medium, and you find it's about 30 milli electron volts. Okay, so this is a situation where at least the two are comparable, if not uh, the interactions are, uh, are even greater. Yeah, and uh, experimentally what is seen, which is uh, somewhat hard for these numerics to precisely capture, is that there's a band gap. Okay, so this is really the beauty of this twisted bilayer graphene. There's a, there are bands that are separated out from everything else in your spectrum. Okay, if on top of that, these bands are very flat. But the zeroth order statement is that there are these bands that are completely separated out from the other bands, and they are active when your chemical potential is near neutrality. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So experimentally, this gap is around 30 uh, milli electron volts. Okay, so um, okay, so one, th one way of thinking about this problem, which I kind of like, uh, is you know this angle is very small. Okay, so the right way to think about this angle is in radians. Uh, it's about 1 60th uh, of a radian. Okay, so everything in our problem will be controlled by this small, small number. There's a small number in your problem. So you've got to keep track of that. Okay, so if you want, for example, to convert these energy scales 
uh, into something you can compare with solids, uh, my general rule of thumb is to multiply by 60. Okay, so that will give you a rough estimate. For example, we said that the interactions were, um, I go back in this, like that. yeah. We said the interaction scale was around 30 milli electron volts. Multiply by 60, you get about two electron volts, which is roughly the, the U of the coup rates, right? Um, also, the transition temperature of superconductivity here is about one or two Kelvin, um, and you can do that, that multiplication, and uh, you'll see it's not, uh, not unreasonable. Okay, so we're really talking about something that's a high temperature superconductor once you make allowance uh, for this uh, rescaling of energy scales. Okay, so what we are, another analogy which may be useful is it's a bit like the C60 materials, which are also known to be superconducting under the right conditions, but instead of having 60 atoms in the unit cell, that's C60, uh, this is more like having 60 times 60 atoms in the unit cell. Okay, that's the kind of scales that we are uh, talking about. Okay, so, um, so the length scale is of this Moiré super lattice is lattice constant divided by theta uh, in radians. Okay, so, um, so now let me uh, kind of remind you how people first looked at this problem. Uh, so because of this uh, small parameter, uh, you can make use of a continuum theory. Okay, so you know that um, graphene has this Dirac-like electronic dispersion near neutrality, uh, and we are thinking of these Dirac electrons uh, flying through this bilayer Moiré, uh, uh, by, uh, you know, uh, Moiré kind of uh, pattern, uh, and their motion is affected by this, uh, by this pattern. Okay, so you can sort of reduce the problem instead of kind of writing down very detailed tight binding models, you can approximate all the physics by uh, the dispersion of these uh, Dirac fermions uh, from the two layers uh, that then move through this potential. Okay, so, um, uh, so what's gonna happen first and foremost is that you're gonna get a valley uh, symmetry. Okay, so uh, the Dirac fermions in the opposite valleys will not talk to each other to a very good approximation uh, because there's an enormous discrepancy in the length scales between the two. Okay, so for example, if this is the Brillouin zone of the original graphene, we're gonna end up with a mini Brillouin zone uh, when you have this larger length scale uh, uh, super lattice uh, applied. And there's a big mismatch between the momenta over here. This is the kind of momenta that you get scattering by when you, get, when you have this uh, periodic potential. Um, there's a big uh, uh, discrepancy between this momentum and uh, the momentum of the underlying electronic lattice. Okay, so questions like, is this a commensurate or incommensurate structure? You can ask those questions, but they're probably not relevant for the problem. Okay, the system doesn't scatter sufficiently large number of times to recognize if it's commensurate or not. Okay, so that is the idea of this continuum theory, uh, and we'll see that it actually is, 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 uh, is exactly the right thing to do when you're in the limit of small angles. Okay, this is really where the small angle approximation comes in. Try to apply this for a 20 degree um, Moray super lattice, uh, it's not gonna work that well. Okay, so how do we end up with this particular angle being special? Um, so there's a simple way of thinking about it. Uh, so of course there's this uh, unperturbed electronic dispersion. It's a linear dispersion and it has an energy scale about uh, you know, 16 electron volts per, uh, you know, when you put in the, the, the lattice constant. Uh, <clears throat> and now you have this uh, procedure where you twist uh, the electronic structure, so you inherit two of these drug cones which are separated by an angle theta. So if you look at the separation in momentum space, it's just theta times, uh, you know, this uh, Brewer zone uh, vector. Okay, so if you uh, figure out what is the energy splitting uh, over here between the Dirac cones, uh, this, is, uh, this has this value. And what we'd like to do is we'd like that the mixing between these Dirac cones, which is the interlayer tunneling, uh, all of this is assuming that we have two independent layers. We just um, write down the free electron dispersion for two independent layers. Uh, when you allow for mixing between them, you'll open up gaps where these things cross, um, and you want those gaps to be large so that you push these levels together and make a flat band. And uh, you can write down a simple criterion for that. The splitting um, you know, should be of the same order as this, uh, this number in order for that to, ap to happen. Okay, so uh, if you put in the, the value for, um, uh, 
you know, for that uh, coupling about 0.3 electron volts, you'll end up with an angle that's very close to the magic angle. Of course, that's a bit fortuitous, but the calculation proceeds in a, in a similar way. Okay, so that's uh, how this particular angle gets uh, singled out. Okay, so I already mentioned that there's this, uh, um, you know, large separation of scales, which leads to this internal symmetry, uh, which we're going to call valley uh, symmetry, or, uh, you know, if you like, there's a U1 symmetry corresponding to the independent charge conservation of electrons in this valley and this other valley, which is, you know, at the other end of the microscopic uh, Brillouin zone. Okay, so, all, uh, so this is going to be an internal quantum number like spin. Okay, and uh, all our degeneracies are going to be doubled uh, because of this internal quantum number. Okay, so the, the, um, uh, the formalism that this continuum theory utilizes is you have two Dirac fermions uh, in the top and in the bottom layer, and they couple through the scattering matrix, um, which is essentially the interlayer tunneling. Okay, but uh, this can have some wave vector dependence, um, and, you, and you just solve this problem. It's kind of like solving a, um, you know, this empty lattice problem. You start with the free electron dispersion and you put in a weak lattice. Uh, it's very much like that. The difference is that you're dealing with Dirac fermions to begin with. Yeah, and that uh, makes it very interesting, gives you all kinds of topological uh, properties. Okay, so this is just the statement that the scattering between the two valleys uh, is suppressed in, an, in the angle one over theta. <clears throat> Okay, so if you solve this theory, uh, so you've got to figure out what this coupling matrix is. Um, I'll, I'll mention that in a second, uh, but there's a natural coupling matrix that you can come up with. Uh, you allow for this uh, coupling between the top and bottom layers, uh, and you end up with a band structure that looks like this. Okay, this is, I did this for a, uh, I'm showing this for a slightly larger angle, two degrees, uh, but qualitatively the physics uh, so, uh, is the same. You have this uh, set of bands near neutrality um, and you see that if you go to the K point, uh, you have a Dirac, uh, Dirac crossing. Okay, so in the mini Brillouin zone, you have a reflection of the original Dirac fermion in that you have a Dirac crossing over here. Okay, so we have two colors over here. You see these are the two different bands uh, corresponding to the opposite values. The dispersions are not exactly the same. The, the two are related by time reversal symmetry. Okay, so along some lines, the dispersions are actually different. But if you tell me the dispersion in one valley, I can always you know, figure out what it is in the opposite valley. It's a, a simple transformation. So often, we will just look at one valley, okay, the, the band structure of one valley. Okay, so one thing that's a little different over here is how many electrons it takes to completely fill this, this band. Okay, so what we're used to in usual band theory is that it takes two electrons to completely fill a band. Right? Uh, you know, in the coup rates, empty to completely full is two electrons. Half filling is one electron per unit cell. Okay, it's a little different over here uh, for two reasons. Uh, one is we have this valley symmetry, so that gives you an additional factor of two. So you might think that there are now four electrons required, completely empty to completely full. Okay, but it turns out the number is actually eight, and the reason is that this band is kind of like the, the dispersion of graphene itself. Okay, so we know that in graphene there are two sublattices, and you need twice as many electrons to completely fill the band. Okay, so in fact, to go from completely empty to completely full, you need eight electrons. Two for spin, two for valley, and two because you have this kind of sublattice structure. Okay, so, um, uh, so this is the number of electrons per unit cell of this Moray uh, superlattice. Okay, so neutrality is right in between. This is if you didn't try to dope it in any way, uh, then you need four electrons up and four below. Okay, and uh, this Dirac physics is going to be, is going to be important. Okay, so now before I, um, I talk about more uh, formal stuff, let me just show you some band structure calculations for this problem. Um, yeah, so, so one thing that is important is, uh, you know, not the kind of universal physics we are talking about, whether there's uh, a degeneracy at the K point, but really if these bands are separated out from all the other bands. Okay, we said that that's important. That's seen in the experiments. Um, you know, is that feature reproduced in these calculations? Okay, so it turns out that if you just do a naive calculation as done in the original papers by McDonald and others, it often happens that you get like this red line, okay, where the band in the center is sometimes touching the bands above and below. Okay, but if you allow for a little bit of lattice relaxation, which is very natural, the two layers are going to kind of relax mechanically in order to find the best structure. And what it likes to do is it likes to expand these AB regions, okay, where, the, um, where it looks like 
Bernal stack graphene. That's mechanically the most stable structure. Okay, so if you uh, allow for that, then there's a nice paper by these people where they put in the relaxation and at least the quantitative aspects of the band structure changes. So you now have a nicely separated band that's close to neutrality. Uh, it was redone in this particular paper. There's this band that's close to neutrality. And you have um, you know, some band gaps separated, uh, that separates it from the other bands. Okay, so effects like this may be important in order to get the quantitative features. Okay, and you can incorporate that into the, into the continuum model. The continuum model has this coupling matrix we said that couples the two layers. It has two parameters. U couples the A and A sites, and U prime couples the A and B sites. And usually you take them to be equal, right? Where, where they, they be different. But if you have an expansion of the A, B regions, you expect this U prime to be larger than U. Okay, and that's essentially what this relaxed structure, band structure can be fitted with. You can fit it with the continuum model where there's more hopping between the A and B regions. Okay, so, uh, so now let's see how this whole band structure that people came up with uh, compares to experiment. Okay, we'd like to experimentally verify this band structure uh, that we have. Uh, and to do that, you want to go to somewhat larger angles. Okay, you don't want to be in the limit. You have a question? Uh, yes, that's right. So it isn't quite DFT. It's a tight binding model where you have certain Slater parameters. Yeah. Can you the ah, so the question was, is this at a commensurate angle and is it DFT? And rewind for the answer. You. Okay, so there's this very nice experiment uh, several years back by Eva Andre's group where they did STM uh, on, this, uh, on the system, slightly larger angle, um, and they see that uh, the electrons are mainly living on these so-called AA sites, form a triangular lattice, uh, and then they can go and look at the, um, uh, the, the tunneling as a function of energy. Okay, and this will give you access to this question of whether the bandwidth uh, is very narrow near the magic angle. Okay, so they have a, um, a sort of a proxy for the bandwidth. It's this Van Hove splitting. It's not exactly the bandwidth, but it scales with the bandwidth. Okay, and what they see is that if they go to large angles, there is some substantial splitting, half an electron volt. But as they approach one degree, which is supposed to be this magic angle, uh, this bandwidth drops uh, precipitously and goes very close to zero, right? So, uh, so this is sort of a nice uh, demonstration that at least the bandwidth aspect of our story seems to be, uh, seems to be correct. Okay, so that's the picture of the AA regions where the electrons seem to be mainly positioned. Um, the AB regions form a honeycomb lattice in contrast. Okay, that's gonna come up again. Okay, but uh, you know, what about the rest of the details? You know, do, they, do we have, for example, this Dirac crossing um, in this uh, mini band? Uh, so there's, there's another very nice experiment due to uh, Pablo's group uh, but a couple of years back. Okay, and um, they looked at somewhat larger angles again, uh, not these uh, things very close to the magic angle, but something closer to two degrees. Okay, I think it was 1.8 degrees. Uh, <clears throat> okay, and now what they see is, uh, they see the insulating states, but only where you would expect them from band theory. Okay, so if you completely empty the band or completely fill the band, uh, you see insulators, that's the red and the blue. They can count how many electrons there are over here, and it's basically eight electrons difference. Okay, and in the center, you see a dip in the conductance, uh, and this is, uh, we think, due to the Dirac points. Okay, you still have some conduction. It's not an insulator like at these uh, limits, but it's reduced compared to being in the middle of the band. Okay, there's better evidence for these Dirac points, uh, these things over here, uh, if you do uh, quantum oscillations. Okay, so you put on a magnetic field um, and uh, sweep the density, for example, uh, and they end up with these Landau fans Okay, you see the Landau fans near neutrality. Uh, they are multiples of eight, uh, but they're offset. Uh, they start with plus minus four. Okay, that's characteristic of a Dirac fermion. So a Dirac fermion will give you Landau fan with plus or minus half per, uh, per Dirac flavor. Uh, here we have eight flavors. Okay, so uh, we have K and minus K, that's two flavors. We have spin and we have valley. So eight in all, you, you should get exactly this Landau fan diagram. Okay, so that's a very nice confirmation that this band, band structure seems to be essentially correct if you go away from the limit of very strong interactions. You go to larger angles where the interactions are weaker because the bandwidth is bigger. You also see the Landau fan diagram over here that, that's near the extreme of this band, almost empty and almost full. Uh, so now you get the normal degeneracy. Okay, you get um, 
a degeneracy of four, and the four is just the, the valley and the spin. You have the multiples of the, the valley and spin. It's a quadratic band, so you don't have this kind of offset that you see over here. Okay, so it all seems consistent with the band structure. Okay, so the new physics really uh, appeared when they took it to this uh, small angle, okay, the, the magic angle, um, or near the magic angle. There, there's some, uh, you have some uh, freedom there. You don't have to be exactly at 1.08 degrees or 1.05. You can uh, move around a little bit, but not too much. 1.2 is, is too far away. Okay, so now you see an insulator, and the insulator appears over here. Okay, so this is midway between the completely empty band and the Dirac point. Okay, so you said there are four electrons to come up here. There are only two electrons to come up to this, uh, the, uh, this Mott insulator. Okay, so this uh, two electrons uh, over here, if you take into account the spin and the valley degeneracy, is a fractional filling. Okay, and uh, you need uh, electron interaction effects uh, in order to explain this. Okay, so, so that's why we think, uh, you know, given the success of the band structure, uh, having an insulator at this filling uh, tells you that electron-electron interactions are important. Okay, so I don't know if I'll have time to talk about the Mott insulator itself, uh, but rather we'll, we'll talk about how we'll try to model this physics. Theoretically, uh, you know, move towards a, a problem like we had for the Cooperage, this Hubbard model, um, and, and ask what is the analog over here. Okay, so, so to do this, we first have to understand what are the symmetries involved in this twisted bilayer graphene. Linetan, how much time do I have? Um, it's just a minute. Okay, good, I got it. Okay, so, so let's look at this uh, picture over here. Uh, so again, this is a, a fairly large angle so that you can sort of see this easily. Uh, so what we did over here is we took a pair of these sheets, uh, you know, placed right on top of each other, and we twisted it by this angle, keeping a point at the center of the hexagon fixed. Oops. Okay, so we kept this point at the center of the hexagon fixed and we twisted it. Okay, so obviously this uh, system has got a C6 symmetry. You can rotate uh, by 60 degrees and uh, it's obviously uh, symmetric. This pair over here goes to this pair over here. It also has uh, what we call a mirror symmetry. So some, pe some other people call it uh, uh, a C2X, um, so imagine that you reflect along this dashed line. Uh, that's not quite a symmetry because you also need to interchange the two layers. Okay, so it's really, if you like, a rotation along this line by 180 degrees. Okay, but if you think of this as a two-dimensional system, it behaves like a reflection. You also have that symmetry. Uh, I should say, though, that this symmetry is often broken in experiments. You put this thing on a substrate, uh, the symmetry will be broken. You cannot do the layer exchange. Okay, but it's sometimes convenient to keep track of the symmetry. Okay, so all in all, you have D6, uh, the, the D6 group. Okay, so of course, in addition, we'll see that because of the small angle, you also have a valley conservation symmetry. Okay, that's not apparent, of course, here. Uh, yeah. Um, so Oscar said it's encapsulated uh, by boron nitride on both sides. In principle, if you did it very carefully, you could uh, have the symmetry if you made sure there were no electric fields. Uh, so that's not done in this particular experiment. Uh, there's another experiment which verified this, I don't know how well known it is, um, by Corey Dean and Andrea Young, where that symmetry is clearly broken. So they apply an electric field and they see a very different response for positive and negative electric fields. So most likely that symmetry is not there unless you really work hard to keep it there. Okay, but good to keep in mind, we'll of course, simplest case, we'll keep that symmetry, but we'll always think about what happens if you break it. Okay, on the other hand, the C6 uh, is simply a symmetry of this uh, structure. Okay, so there's a different structure which you can look at, which I think Oscar must have talked about, uh, which only has D3 symmetry. Okay, so, uh, so now again, you have these two layers that are superimposed. Imagine twisting them, but now keep <clears throat> the common um, site uh, fixed. Okay, so you see this does not have <clears throat> uh, 60 degree rotation symmetry because this side didn't have 60 degree rotation symmetry. You only can rotate by 120 degrees. Okay? Uh, so there's that rotation symmetry, uh, C3. Um, yeah, that's a symmetry and uh, there is again this mirror symmetry, sometimes called C2X uh, or C2Y. Maybe. Okay, we'll, we'll call it the MX uh, mirror symmetry. 
Okay, so now we seem to have these two different uh, implementations of symmetry, uh, and which one should we use? Okay, so of course, if you have a, you know, bilayer graphene, when you put them on top of each other, uh, there's no reason why you should get one or the other structure. In fact, in general, you might think that these things are somewhere in between, and you don't have any rotation symmetry. Okay, so the nice thing is that if you're in the small angle limit, it turns out it doesn't matter. Okay, so in the continuum theory that I talked about, uh, this displacement symmetry, where you line up the, the sites, uh, is completely irrelevant. It doesn't affect uh, the electronic structure. Okay, so, so one way to, uh, to see this, um, uh, sorry, this, I don't think I need this right now. Okay, so, um, so really this, even if you started with the C3 symmetry, if you're at small angles, uh, you will have an emergent C6 symmetry. Okay, and what we believe is that it's important to keep the maximal symmetry that's present, uh, then you do not have accidental degeneracies. If you have a degeneracy, it's always explained uh, by some symmetry or the other. Okay, so to kind of, um, you know, in, in those pictures I showed you, those structures look kind of different. Okay, so you may worry, is this really a symmetry or how good a symmetry it is? Okay, so, um, <clears throat> so, my, uh, so Adrian came up with this eye test. <laughs> uh, so some of these structures have C6, uh, some of them don't. And actually this is at a fairly large angle, it's not one degree, uh, it's at six degrees. Uh, but you can see that uh, it's actually not that easy to tell uh, which one is six-fold symmetric, and which one is just three-fold symmetric. Okay, and uh, uh, if you're just curious to know the answer, anyone wants to guess? Uh, <laughs> someone has really good eyes. Uh, I kind of get hypnotized when I look at this, so I don't, don't want to look at it too long. But uh, So these two don't have six-fold symmetric. Okay, it's very hard to tell from just looking at it, and if you cannot tell, probably the electrons can't tell either. Right? So, uh, the electronic structure of these different things are, are look very similar, and you can see that in uh, ab initio calculations. Okay, so now let's talk about the details of this band structure, and a very important part of this uh, are these Dirac points. Okay, so uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at a single valley, so we're gonna fix on either the K or the minus K valley. <coughs> okay, so when you do that, you essentially break time reversal symmetry because you picked a valley. Um, and you can ask what the symmetries are. Uh, so you have this a combination of time reversal and rotation. You can think of this as a combination of C2 and uh, time reversal. Rotate by 180 degrees followed by time reversal. That keeps you at the same valley. Okay, so that is a symmetry of the single valley problem. Uh, and let's just look at one, uh, one valley uh, dispersion. Okay, the opposite value you can get by simply some symmetry transformation. Okay, and you look at this, you see these Dirac points, and you can ask what is it is, uh, that's protecting these Dirac points uh, in the continuum uh, model, and it turns out that it's essentially these symmetries. Okay, so if you give me these two symmetries, uh, what you can show <coughs> is that the bands at this point, uh, they have a eigenvalue under C3 rotation, which is omega, the cube root of unity, um, then the C2T symmetry, if I just take the cube of the symmetry, uh, the C2T symmetry forces it to be degenerate to another representation, which is omega star. Uh, so you get a two-fold degeneracy, and the degeneracy between the different, um, uh, the two different valleys is ensured by some other symmetry, okay? A uh, combination of time reversal and another symmetry. Okay, so it's really the combination of these symmetries that gives you this, uh, this particular degeneracy. And if you lose any one of them, you're allowed to write down a mass term that gaps out these Dirac uh, fermions. Okay, of course, you could argue that mass term is gonna be small if this is a good uh, approximate symmetry, uh, but it's best to start where, with, a, with a point where you have the symmetry uh, present. Okay, so if you just stare at the representations in this uh, figure, you know, based on some earlier work, we figured out that <coughs> uh, this is only compatible <coughs> uh, with uh, sites on the honeycomb lattice. Okay? <clears throat> yeah, so, um, uh, so, so that's, that's one uh, piece of information that you have. And you can ask, can I reproduce just those two bands uh, by some tight binding model uh, on the honeycomb lattice? Okay, just the, uh, just the pair of bands living in a single valley. Yeah, and it turns out that uh, there is a problem doing that. Um, the problem is that these two Dirac points are kind of strange. Okay, on the face of it, it looks like some dispersion, like graphene dispersion. Uh, but if you go and examine these Dirac points in more detail, 
you find out that they have the same chirality. Okay, so if you go around them, you get a Berry's phase, which could be plus pi or minus pi. That sign, it turns out, makes sense in this particular symmetry setting. Uh, and you can compare them, and they have the same sign. Okay, this is assuming some smooth gauge and so on. You have to be a bit careful. Um, but there are many different ways of seeing that these two have the same chirality. Okay, so if you started with a tight binding model, even if it's on the honeycomb lattice uh, for these two, two, two bands, uh, you'd always get opposite chirality. There's some essential part of the physics that you're going to miss. Uh, and it, this may be important or not important for the actual physics and the material, but you know, you'd like to be accurate when you capture these, uh, these things. Okay, so, uh, so this is really the obstruction. If you wanted to write down a valley-filtered, spin-filtered band structure, just for the two bands, while keeping all the symmetry that preserves the drag points, the rotation symmetries, and so on, uh, you run into this obstruction. Okay, so let me kind of explain this obstruction in a physical way. Um, uh, so this goes under the, the notion of a flipped Haldane model. Uh, so let's say you had some band structure. We'll, we'll argue by contradiction. Okay? You have a band structure that gives you a pair of Dirac points uh, with the same chirality. So now imagine that I put on a staggered potential. I change the potential on the A and B sides in opposite directions, just an on-site term. What you can show is that this is going to gap the system. It breaks one of the protecting symmetries. It gaps the system. You get two bands that are separated by a gap, and you can calculate the churn number of the bands and you'll find that the bands have churn number. Okay, remember we already broke time reversal by selecting a value. Okay, so this staggered potential actually gives you a churn number. Okay, this is the same effect of the Haldane term. If you actually had a honeycomb lattice and you had this Haldane second neighbor hopping, you'd also get churn number. But here you can accomplish that, and the only way to accomplish that is by an on-site term, staggered potential. Okay, you get a mass term that's independent of K, opposite chiralities, they end up giving you the same, uh, they give you a non-zero churn number. Okay, but this is actually a contradiction because you can imagine increasing the strength of this potential so that the electrons just sit on one of these two sites, but that model cannot have churn number. It's just electrons sitting on a site, right? So this combination of uh, having the standard potential giving you churn number and having just a two-band model, there's no additional stuff over here uh, that can avoid this conclusion. Uh, in the limit of large potential, you're really on site. Uh, that's what generates this... Um, this kind of no-go argument. Okay, it tells you that simple tight binding model like this cannot capture the physics of this nearly flat band. Okay, you've got to do something a little more uh, involved. Uh, so there's kind, of a there's kind of a menu of options you have. Okay, simplest thing fails, what can you do? The first thing you can try to do is to lose some symmetries. Okay, just drop some symmetries. Either try to implement it later or just don't worry about the symmetry. Okay, all these symmetries are ones that are going to gap the drag points. Okay, they're, they're going to do something bad to your uh, band structure, but you know, that's kind of the trade-off. Okay, and you can do that, and uh, that's essentially what uh, you know, uh, these people did, uh, which that, that's how I understand Oscar's construction, uh, uh, which is you lose, uh, you, you take one of these D3 structures, you lose the C2 symmetry, uh, and then you can proceed, you know, there's no obstruction, and you can uh, complete this program. We had a different way of doing it. Initially, we lost the value you want. Okay, so forget about the value U1. You can come up with some model. Uh, you can try to implement it in the end. Uh, we have some pr procedure to try to implement that. Uh, but you get some four-band model which does not have the symmetry. Okay, and these are different implementations. You lose different symmetries, so you cannot directly compare these models. So that's one option. Let me just give you a little more detail before I tell you the other option, which I uh, actually prefer. <clears throat> Okay, so, so we're gonna take this approach. Forget about value U1. So we have these two different bands from opposite valleys. Let me combine them, okay, into a single problem. Uh, I'm not gonna uh, distinguish them. I'm gonna try, try to write down Vanier functions for the set of four bands. Okay, and uh, it turns out that you can do. There are, there are no obstructions then. Uh, and from the representation physics we talked about, uh, we know that these Vanier centers have to fall on the honeycomb lattice sites. Okay, we're gonna get two Vanier orbitals for every honeycomb site, a uh, total of four. Um, and, uh, you, know, the, um, you know, that much is fine. Uh, but we saw in the experiments, for example, that most of the electronic density lives on the triangular lattice sites. Okay, so that seems to be a problem. How do you reconcile the two? But when Adrian went and, you know, calculated these Vanier functions, it has exactly the right form. Um, it has this form. 
Uh, it's centered on a particular point, you know, which is this, let's say this point over here, honeycomb lattice site, the AB site, that's the center. Uh, but most of the weight of this wave function is actually on the, in these three lobes. Okay, so um, you know, we thought of, I thought of calling this a maple leaf, uh, you know, something like that, but Adrian says that most people know about fidget spinners more than they know about maple leaves. So anyway, we call this the fidget spinner vanier states, and I think uh, Oscar and uh, this paper by Koshino, Liang, and Yuan also have a similar kind of uh, picture with a, the with a different symmetry representations. Okay, so, so that's one possible resolution. You forget about the valley, and then you've got to do something at the end in order to try to keep track of that symmetry. Either you fine tune your model, or you have to try to implement the symmetry in some non-local way. Okay, so we don't quite know how to do that when you have interactions. Okay, so um, you know, maybe that's something to try to work out. Um, uh, it's interesting to work out, but there's a different option. Okay, the second option over here, which is to extend the model to include more bands. Okay, this is kind of familiar to people who do cuprate physics. Uh, you have these PD models of cuprates. Okay, you add oxygen. Um, is that 10 or 5? It's over. All right. Okay. Yeah, actually, I just have five slides. <laughs> Let me quickly go through. Anyway, so this is like this PD thing, and it has all the symmetries. Um, so I, I won't really talk too much about it, but we can get good uh, agreement with the continuum model. Uh, and our tight binding model with these extended bands. So you've got to include some more bands. The minimum is four additional bands, but you can get all the physics in one, one valley with all, the, uh, with all the symmetries, and it has some interesting connection to the so-called, this idea of, of fragile topology. Okay, so usually you have a topological band. You should have another one which has the opposite topology to cancel it. You have a churn number band, you have to have anti-churn number to, to cancel it. Here it turns out that the kind of topology over here this, you know, having the same chirality, uh, you don't need that kind of cancellation. That's why we call it fragile. You can add bands, which is what we do, which are simple atomic insulators. The things that are close to being just localized on sites, and they are able to resolve this obstruction and allow you to write down a tight binding model. Yes, anyway, this is to appear soon. Um, so let me just uh, end uh, with just two other things which I didn't have time to talk about. The first question is, what is the mod phase? Okay, and we have some Suggestion in, in terms of intervalley, it's not internally coherent, it's intervalley coherent. Uh, so it breaks the valley you want spontaneously. Um, and we also had a different paper looking at the superconductor uh, in the completely opposite limit, which is the limit of very weak interactions. If people do this in the cuprates all the time. It's been quite um, successful for the iron nictides as well. Um, so various people, including Andre, have uh, worked on this. Uh, usually, you need some kind of nesting to drive this kind of superconductivity. So if you told me you had a triangular lattice at half filling, there's no nesting really to drive that. But this model is different. If you look at the Fermi surfaces, they have two valleys. Each valley is not very well nested, but the intervalley Fermi surfaces are pretty well nested. Okay, so you can use that to drive uh, some interesting physics at weak coupling. Um, and uh, you, start, you do an RPA calculation, and then you use that to, to figure out what the pairing is. Okay, and we predicted this kind of topological superconductors. It's very natural on a triangular lattice geometry to get a P plus IP or a D plus ID superconductor. Okay, and we get that. Both of these are actually spin singlet. Okay, and uh, it may see, seem strange to say a P plus IP is spin singlet, uh, but you've got to remember you also have a, a valley quantum number okay, that can absorb uh, the minus sign. And the real question, I think, is which of the two is it? Is it P plus IP or D, D minus I? These are the same symmetry, but they're topologically different, different number of edge states. Yeah, but uh, you know, that's really doing the physics in the opposite weak coupling limit. Okay, so let me stop here. <laughs>